Hi, so uh, welcome back everybody. Um, so in the second part of this project, of this talk, as I said, I was gonna talk about what we're doing now, kind of going forward to tackle things like behavioral genetics. Um, oh yeah, I started this with just this movie. Uh, so with this kind of new project, we're actually working with pet owners who are providing us with DNA samples from their dogs and then just telling us all about them. So this is a video of a, of a dog owner doing a fantastically wonderful job of getting a saliva swab on her dog. So we have to keep this video in. Um, but I'm also going to start back with this, this picture that I showed you right at the end of the first half um, where I was talking about how this is useful for finding pathways and things. But I wanted to also comment that the other thing you will notice about this particular picture is that there are a lot of different gene names in there. Um, behavior, behavioral traits are incredibly complicated, and the expectation here will be that there are probably thousands of different variation in thousands of different genes that are contributing to something as complicated as, as behavioral traits. Um, and then you have to remember, kind of when I talked at the beginning of the, the kind of whole thing about gene regulation and how things are interacting with one another, you've got thousands of different genes, there's variation in those genes that are influencing the trait you're interested in, and then all those genes are interacting with each other all the time and influencing how they behave. So you kind of end up with this massive hairball of interactions. Um, it's a really complicated thing. There is a way to get around this, to start trying to figure out which genes are actually involved in learning things about pathways, even for incredibly complicated traits. Um, and just uh, last year, I think, this paper was published. It's about schizophrenia in humans. And it was the first study of a psychiatric disease in humans that really had good statistical significance. And they found 108 different uh, positions in the genome that seemed to be correlated with your risk of getting schizophrenia. Um, beautiful study, it worked really well. They had a plot in it that was very like those plots I showed you in the first half with all the dots on it going across the genome. This was from their human study. Um, but the reason I talk about this is this particular piece of it. So it worked beautifully, it was great. But in order to have statistical power, they needed about 40,000 affected individuals and 113,000 controls. And so this is how you study something that's really complicated where you have a lot of variation in genes um, each of which is contributing to your risk of having, say, a behavioral trait or a disorder, but only a tiny little bit is by having really big sample sizes. And so the kind of summary from this is even if behavioral genetics is easier in dogs because we have all of this past selection for particular traits that is feeding into whether you know, certain populations of dogs are prone to different behaviors, we're going to need a lot of dogs. Even if it's 10 times easier it is than it is in humans, we're talking about 12, 15,000 dogs. And so we set up a citizen science project. We thought, you know, so we've actually been dealing with this, with, the, with this problem of sample size for years in dogs. And I remember years ago when I was studying uh, cancer called osteosarcoma, we gave a talk at, at the cancer program at, at the Broad Institute. And I said, there are, you know, millions of dogs in this country that are getting cancer. And they're all being treated by veterinarians. It's a fantastic model system for studying cancer because so many dogs are getting it. And it's a disease that's very similar to the human disease. And then I presented my study where we had about 150 cases and 150 controls. And somebody in the room kind of asked, and they were like, so if there's millions of dogs in this country that are getting cancer, why are your, your sample sizes so small? And the fact of the matter was we were having a lot of trouble getting dogs to participate in our studies. We just didn't, we were trying to go through veterinary hospitals, and while they were trying to help as much as they could, we just weren't getting that many in. And I thought, well, why don't we go directly to the dog owners and ask them if they want to participate in our research? So we set up this project called Darwin's Dogs. It's just a website you go to it and you basically sign up. You tell us all about your dog's behavior and personality on the short questionnaires on the website. We're going to be adding in health surveys in the future as well. And then you mail us a saliva sample from your dog using a kit that we send you. Um, this is the kind of questions we ask. This is the one um, Leif caveat here, Leif was actually my cat, um, because I don't have a dog, but Leif enjoys playing with toys. Um, we don't use the cat data in the real dog studies. We took it out before we, we you know, started using it. Um, and then people answer, and you know, most people strongly agree or agree that their dog enjoys playing with toys. Um, and so as I said, after they've answered a bunch of questions, we send them the swab with our fancy little kit, um, and then they send it back to our lab. And often they put pictures in the box when they send it back, so we've got those all stuck to the window as well. Um, so we set up this project a couple of years ago, and, and the, the first thing we learned about this project um, was that people really, really like talking about their dogs. Uh, so we've got, I think as of today, I actually looked up this morning, we've got about 19,000 dogs signed up, um, which is a big number, but the really important number to me as a scientist is the second number, which is that those people, the, the owners of ENTS actually answered 2.2 million questions for us at this point in time. 
If all we needed were DNA samples from dogs, that would be a much easier challenge. But the DNA sample itself isn't useful unless we know about the dog, unless we know about its personality, its behavioral traits, its, what diseases it's getting. And so the fact that people are willing to give us that information is a really valuable thing about this approach. Um, we've also got about 4,000 DNA samples from kits we've sent out. Um, and that comes to a little bit of, a, of an unanticipated problem we've had with this particular citizens in science project. So when I set it up, I was like, this is great. People love their dogs. We're going to get like a thousand people to sign up. It's going to be incredible. Um, we didn't. We've got 19,000 people signed up, which is amazing. Um, the only problem is that it costs us probably about $200 a dog to actually do the genetics. And it turns out that if you multiply 200, <laughs> even by 5,000, that ends up being like, what, a million dollars, which we don't have. And so people have been very patient with us. Um, and we're basically trying to move. Uh, we're looking for funding sources all the time. And our goal is to actually sequence all of these dogs that we're getting in. And the project's not stopping anytime soon, but we do appreciate everybody who signed up out there and is wondering what's going on. We really appreciate your patience. Um, we've got dogs from all the way across the country, which is fantastic. And in the next uh, month or so, we're going to be expanding it so that anybody in the world can participate. Anybody in the world can sign up on the website right now. We just can't send kits internationally yet. Um, and the really nice thing about the study, and this is actually reflects something that you can do in dogs that has been more of a problem in human genetics. So a big problem in human genetics is they tend to get certain demographics to sign up for their projects. And so there tends to be a bias towards um, you know, people with higher incomes. There tends to be a bias towards um, white people versus other, other, um, demogra uh, other ethnicities and things like that. That isn't something we're seeing with the dogs. So if we actually look at the dogs that are signed up for our project as to whether people tell us they're a rescue, um, they got them at a shelter, um, breeders, and, and, and other whatever that is, that actually almost seems to, to perfectly match what people find when they do a survey of dogs across the country. Um, most of our dogs are happy which is good. Um, your dog enjoys life. The vast majority of people strongly agree or agree. Um, everything set up as 10 question surveys. And we had a survey that only had nine questions in it. So one of uh, Jesse McClure was working with me as a postdoc at the time, had to add a 10th question. So he added in the question, does your dog know that he or she is a dog? Um, People either love this question or hate this question. It may tell us more about the owners than about the dogs. We're not entirely sure. Um, and when we actually ask the question on the website, it doesn't actually say your dog. We'll insert their name into it so it's individualized. Um, so what are we asking about? We're asking about uh, morphological traits, so like the white coat color. Um, we ask how long the dog's fur is. We ask about ear shape. We ask about size. Um, one of the reasons we're doing this is that we want to ask about things where people have already figured out genes that are involved. So it's kind of like a positive control. We want to see if we find the same thing that people have found previously. And also because we want to find new genes for some of these really interesting traits. Um, we ask about artificially selected behaviors, things like retrieving, pointing, and even whether your dog seeks companionship from people, which some people have suggested may be a selected behavior in kind of lap dogs. Um, we ask about complex behavioral traits and disorders. So we build on... Um, very difficult work that people have done previously, kind of developing surveys to ask about um, behavioral traits and disorders in dogs, things like impulsivity, um, uh, compulsive disorders, uh, quality of life. And, and they've actually done the work kind of validating the survey. So we've incorporated those into the website. And we're actually getting what we call a really nice distribution. So what these plots are just showing is that the dark um, in the one on the left, the, one, the, the dogs that are kind of in the two tails, as we call it, are the ones that are kind of the extremes. So we have dogs that seem to be very impulsive or dogs that seem to be very not impulsive. And so we could actually compare those two groups genetically. Um, and then we have this fantastic set of traits that I really like. I have no idea if they're going to work. Um, so we sat down with this group of, pe of people from IABC, this animal behavior group, and we said, OK, we're looking for traits that are genetic. So we define that as there seems to be some breed predisposition. So some breeds seem to do it more than others. And that would indicate that genetics was involved, that are easy for owners to identify, and that people don't care about. So they're not going to try and train their dog to do it or train their dog not to do it. They're trying to have things that are genetic with a minimal amount of environmental influence. And they came up with, I think it's about 15 questions that they came up with. The, the top scoring one was actually whether they turn in circles before pooping. Definitely not one as a scientist that I would have come up with on my own, so we put it on there. Um, head tilt, that adorable head tilt that some dogs do, whether your dog puts your, their paw on, on, on your feet, whether they cross their front paws when they sit down. And, and the really funny thing about this is that it, it really also illustrates the power of this approach because you, know, you talk to people and you're like, does your dog eat grass? And people are like, why would my dog eat grass? Or they're like, oh my god, my dog totally eats grass. I've always wondered why my dog eats grass. 
but they know. And I think that's something that's sometimes underrated is that people spend a lot of time watching their dogs. And you can ask them an incredibly vast range of things and they'll actually be able to answer them for you. And then we ask things like um, whether they lick their empty bowl after finishing food. That was one that our group came up with. But it actually seems to be correlated with some of the things that other questions we ask related to food consumption. And we also just recently added on a kind of new set of surveys um, called the Food Allergy Surveys. Um, so at the Broad Institute, one of the places I work, actually has a new initiative to study food allergies in people called the Food Allergy Science Initiative. And it turns out that there's many similarities between food allergy in dogs and food allergy in people. And so we actually are working with them. We put a whole group set of surveys on the website related to food allergies. And now we're sequencing the dogs um, where people have actually answered those questions. And we're going to see whether we can find anything connected to that. Um, so just to kind of end this section, uh, so my, my nightmare that I wake up within the middle of the night having set up this whole project is that people are going through the website and just randomly answering things without even reading them, because that would just totally mess everything up. Um, so the first question we had to ask ourselves is, does this approach work at all? And so we took 374 dogs where we had both responses to the surveys on the website and we had gotten a saliva swab and we genotyped them. This was before we're using sequencing now, but genotyping is basically where you look at a, a set of markers across the genome. And in this case, we were looking at about 770,000 SNPs across the genome. And, um, and we had this one phenotype, this one question. So there's lots of really complicated ways you can measure the size of the dog. We can't do that. We tried mailing people tape measures, totally didn't work. Um, so we just have one question about size. And the question is, how tall is your dog at the shoulders when they stand next to, well, next to you or next to an adult person? And there were you know, five answers. It's basically ankle high, calf high, knee high, thigh high, or hip high. And so we did the same thing we did for coat color in the first half of this talk and with OCD. And we said, we compared, dot, we took that trait, we took the genetics, and we looked for things in the genome that were correlated with how big the dog was. And it worked beautifully. If you're not used to seeing these plots, you might not realize that, but that's a beautiful GWAS, as we call it, genome-wide association plot. And so we're using a very high threshold for saying that something is significant. So that's 5 times 10 to the minus 8th, which I think is what? 0 0.0000005, a very low p-value. Um, and we're only looking, we're only saying the most interesting things are above that threshold. And the really nice thing is, is we, it, it's a good positive control. We're finding a lot of genes that people have previously been found to be connected to size in dogs, including things like IGF-1, which is kind of the big gene that's been connected in, purebred, in studies in purebred dogs. But we're also finding genes that didn't seem to have actually been reported as connected to size in dogs as well, including this gene right down at the end, l coral one which hasn't been really talked about in dogs, but has actually been um, linked to size of horses. So it's a really beautiful illustration of, first of all, that this whole thing will actually work, which is a huge relief to me. But also, um, and the other big question that went into this is people have done a lot of genetics in purebred dogs. And the nice thing about doing a genetic study in a purebred dog population is that all the dogs are... Um, not, there's not that much genetic diversity in there to deal with. Um, and genetic diversity can be a really good thing in a study, but you have to be really careful to control for how closely related two individuals are. Because if you think about it, what we're looking for are things that differ depending on, in this case, how big you are. And so we're saying people that are really, really big should look different from people that are really, really small, and people that are really, really small should all look the same as each other. And it works really well, except that if two people are related to one another, they're more likely to be the same just because they're related, not because of anything to do with their size. And so you have to take into account how related the individuals in your study are when you're actually doing the analysis. And the big question with what we're doing, because we, we take all the dogs. We take purebred dogs, we're looking at mixed breed dogs, we're looking at golden doodles and things that we have absolutely no idea what they are, and you know, village dogs from, from islands and things like that. And so we didn't know whether this was actually going to work, and it worked beautifully. So it turns out that using some of the methods they have out today, we could actually control for all the different levels of relatedness and get a really nice study out. Um, so that worked really nicely, and the next step will be to go on and do this with actually behavioral traits like anxiety and things like that. We tried it with, with our 300 dogs, but as I said at the beginning, behavior is very complicated, and so it does not look like this when you study a behavioral trait with three or 400 dogs. But we're hoping as our sample sizes get bigger, this is what we're going to get out for, beha for behaviors like anxiety or noise phobia or something like that. Um, so as I said at the beginning, uh, just now, any dog can sign up any time. Um, people keep asking me how many dogs I want, and I kind of tongue-in-cheek say, all of them? Um, the more dogs we have, the more we can actually ask, and the better questions we can ask. Um, we don't own the data. Um, nobody owns the data. We're going to share this data with other scientists. We'll share anything we find with you. This is intended to be an open resource. 
uh, people are contributing their time to come and actually answer all of those questions. And so we're going to be, we, you know, the data will all be shared and there's just going to be an easy way to kind of go to the website and just download it. Um, this has made a huge difference in human genetics. When you put 100,000 people worth of data out there and just let scientists start playing with it, they find things that, you know, just, they just try things that nobody would have thought to try if you kind of just left it with a small group of people. And that's kind of what I would like to see with dog genetics is that we just put a huge amount of data out there. All the really scientists out there that are really fantastic at working with big data sets come in and say, hey, look, data. I wonder what I could do with this. And we'll start learning things that you know, I would have never thought to try. And so I think it's going to be a lot of fun over the next couple of years as these data sets start getting bigger. Um, and so that was what I wanted to say about the genetics that we're doing. Um, but the other thing I wanted to address was the, the question of mutts, of mixed breed dogs. And so as I, I mentioned during the question and answer we just did, one of the th questions we had when we were starting all of this is that I, like many other scientists in dog genetics, had only really studied purebred dogs. Um, but most dogs are not purebred. Even within the US, most dogs are not purebred. And we didn't know anything about the non-purebred dogs. We didn't know anything about mutts, just dogs that were mixes of many different breeds. Nobody really looked at their genetics in any kind of detail. And so we did this study that being the Darwin's Dogs Project, we then had to call the Mendel's Mutts Project after Gregor Mendel the monk because, you know, alliteration and stuff. Um, but we, so we took 21 dogs, as I said um, earlier. These were basically, the only criteria was you had to have a dog that you had no idea what it was and you had to run into me within this kind of um, two week period when we were looking for samples. And it does include my sister's dogs and a few other dogs from our lab and things like that. Um, and we think this is the first time people had done whole genome sequencing of just mixed breed dogs. People have looked at village dogs, but not the kind of US just mixes of different breeds. Um, and so what you're looking at when you're looking at a mixed breed dog, so a village dog is often a dog that's never been part of a breed. So it's not like it has breed ancestry, it's just a dog. It's been there, it's a dog. A mixed breed dog or a mutt is, a, is thought to be mostly a mix of different purebred dogs, although that's not totally sure how often that's true. And so what happens when you mix breed dogs? So I've got a little picture here. You've got a golden retriever and a border collie. This is just representing, if you remember from the first half, you get two copies of your genome, one from your mother and one from your father. So for each of your chromosomes, you have two copies. And so for the golden retriever, he's got two golden retriever copies of this chromosome, so he's got two blue lines. And the border collie has two border collie copies of this chromosome, so he's got two red lines. Um, and so when, they cro when, they, when you mix them together, and they have a puppy, he's basically half golden retriever and half border collie. Um, so you take your half golden retriever, half border collie, which I'm sure has a name, I just don't know what it is, <laughs> and cross it with a poodle because people cross everything with poodles, so I figured I better go with a poodle. Um, and so we got a poodle here, it's green. And so you would think what would happen is that you would make a puppy, um, and that puppy is inheriting the golden retriever blue chromosome from his we'll say mother, and then the other puppy is inheriting the poodle green chromosome, sorry, the, the orange border collie chromosome from his mother. Um, but it's not quite that simple. So there's one extra step in here, and it's something called recombination. And so what happens is that there's this thing called recombination where basically two pieces of the chromosomes get swapped around. And then one of those chromosomes gets passed on to the puppy. Then you make the other puppy, either you've got another recombination, and they get a different kind of section. And so that puppy, got mostly golden retriever, but he's got a little bit of border collie coming in. The other puppy actually has a less golden retriever and more border collie coming in from that side. So there's some variation starting to crop up even now. And so you just kind of keep on doing that. And with every generation, you're getting, a, a re on average, it's one recombination per chromosome. And so what you have when you look at mixed breed dogs or mutts is that each of their chromosomes is actually a tiling pattern. It's like a mosaic of ancestry from all these different breeds as you go across it. And so if you think about the breed tests that are out there, what are they doing? So they're looking for those blocks of ancestry. They're trying to count. They're going across the genome and you're saying, is this golden retriever here? Is this border collie ancestry here? And things like that. And so there's two critical things that kind of affect how well your breed test is going to work. There's the number of markers and the number of breeds in what they call their reference panel. So the number of markers is important because if you think about it, here you've got your two chromosomes from a mutt and you've tested, you've tested it, and this is what its actual breed ancestry is. So these are its two chromosomes. Just trust me when I say the dark purple there actually adds up to being about 25% of those two chromosomes, so I've made it about a quarter of the pie chart. That's what is actually going on in this particular mutt if we were perfect and we knew exactly what the answer was. If you only test, for example, three markers across that genome, you're only seeing exactly what is in that position where you have your marker. 
So even though you've got all these different breeds going in, you might only detect, in this little example I put up, two of those. So even though there's all those different breeds in there, you've only detected the purple and the yellow. Now say there's a really bad situation and it turns out, so the way the breed tests are work is they're going across and they find a marker. And they want to say, what breed is this marker the closest match to? And it's usually kind of a pattern of markers. And so they have to have the reference panel. So they go back to the reference panel and they compare that set of markers back to the reference panel and they say, which breed is this the closest match to? It goes through all the breeds in the reference panel and identifies what the closest match is. So if you're missing a breed from your reference panel, it can't find that breed. And so for example, if you just didn't happen to have the purple breed in your reference panel, you wouldn't be able to detect it. And you might suddenly decide that this dog was all whatever the orange breed is. Um, that's obviously kind of a worst case scenario. And this gets much better if you test a lot of markers. Because if you, rather than testing three, if you tile markers all the way across your chromosomes, instead of seeing just those two breeds, you might get all of those different positions. And so you actually get a much closer representation of which breeds are in that dog. It's not exactly the same, but it's very close. But you still have that problem that if you don't have, say, the purple breed in your reference panel, if you just don't see that purple segment, you might get a very different representation of what's in that dog than if you do have it in there. And so those two different components, the number of markers and the breeds that you have in your reference panel, are both affecting the accuracy of your breed test. Um, we've developed our own breed test. It turned out to be a little bit complicated, but we got there. Um, and so we have, basically, we have this additional thing that we're doing um, where if it turns out, so like that purple thing where we don't have the breed in the reference panel, um, rather than just kind of ignoring that we couldn't figure out what those markers were, we mark it as something we call no call or missing. And so we'll have a chunk of the genome that we just say, rather than just kind of ignoring that we couldn't figure out what it was, we're like, we couldn't figure out what this piece is. So rather than getting a plot where we ignore the purple, we basically get this chunk of gray. And we actually had a lot of discussions when we were figuring out how to show the results of our breed test about whether to show the chunk of gray, because people get very confused by the fact that we have this big section that's called not called or missing. And it's basically stuff that we can't figure out. And we talked about it, and we were like, well, it's there. We don't know what it is. We're scientists, so we're just going to leave it in there. Um, we really don't know what it is. We think there's, a, there's three different possibilities. It could be that we just don't have enough um, so there's a number of markers that you test in the dog you're looking at, but there's also the number of markers that they've tested in the reference breeds. And so if you just, we think sometimes they just haven't looked at enough information from the reference breeds themselves to make a good match. Um, we think that sometimes there's just a breed missing from the reference panel. And then there's this other thing where everybody just kind of assumes that these mixed breed dogs are mixes of all these different breeds, but there's a lot of other dogs on this planet who are not in those breeds. And so it might just be non-breed ancestry, so it's not going to match any of the breeds. Um, I did go through and look at what the different tests are doing because people are always curious about this. So Wisdom Panel has the smallest number of markers. It's doing 1,800 markers, um, but it does seem to have the biggest number of breeds in its reference panel. Embark has many, many more markers. It's doing, as it says on its, I just took exactly what it says on its website, over 200,000. Um, the caveat to remember here is that uh, companies don't publish their results for generally, at least as far as I know, they haven't published the algorithms or their accuracy in peer-reviewed journals. So I... People keep asking me how well do the breed tests work, and the only answer I can give is I have no idea because there's no, no data out there for me to look at to assess that question. They could be performing incredibly well. They may be performing badly. There's no way for me to, to know that. Um, with our, the, the, the approaches we're using, we did have about 900,000 markers. We're actually scaling up now, so we're going to be doing about 5 million markers per dog. We don't have that many dogs in our reference panel because we're relying on publicly available data, but hopefully that will continue to get much better over time as we get more data. Um, and the other problem, as I said, is generally in the, the dogs that we have in our reference panel, we have those 200,000 markers that we've looked at across the whole genome. The genome is actually 2.4 billion bases, and we think that when you're looking at mutts that have gotten really, really mixed up, the 200,000 markers of data that we have from the breeds just isn't enough for a lot of them to figure out what's going on. So hopefully that will get better too. Um, so how do you develop a breed test? Um, I put this in here. It's a little complicated. If you get lost, don't worry about it. Um, but the way we, we develop a breed test is we can't just go develop a breed test and test it on mutts because the reason we're developing a breed test is we want to figure out what breeds are in the mutts. So we don't know what the answer is, so we can't actually assess how well our test works because who knows if we're right or not. So the way we actually develop the test is we take the reference data from about 93 breeds that's what's publicly available, and we, um, we take that data and we make mutts. 
we just take their DNA and we do the whole recombination and making chromosomes and everything inside of a computer. And because we've made those MUTs, we know what they are. And so then we can actually develop an algorithm. For anybody in here who's a, um, who's a computer scientist, I, I was like, it's apparently something called a support vector machine, basically. It does this hidden Markov model thing as a whole probability-based thing. But we basically take the MUTs, we take the breeds, we run them through this algorithm. And then because we know, because we've made the MUTs and we know what they are, we can actually figure out how well our algorithm is performing. And so I can tell you that we actually tend to be pretty good at calling breeds, but only if they're over, I think at about, if they're over 3% of the ancestry in that dog, we tend to be right most of the time. And as the percent of ancestry from that breed that's in a dog goes up, we're going to be better and better at actually detecting that it's there. Um, so here's some results. This is Nellie. She's a beagle. She's from Tennessee. Um, she gets very excited every time a pickup truck drives by playing country music. She belongs to a friend of me, mine called Margie. Um, so Nellie is <laughs> supposedly a beagle. Um, she is, in fact, a beagle. Um, Margie swears that the not matched is probably chupacabra, but I don't, you know, we don't have chupacabra in our reference set, so I can actually tell you. Um, but yeah, so this is how, this is what the results look like for a purebred. So she's 88% of the genome. We are really, really sure that it's beagle. We're seeing a little bit of blood hand and chow, chow showing up. As I said, if it's under about 3%, we're not super confident. We're actually pretty sure we get it wrong a lot of the time, so that may be wrong, or it may be that there's parts of the genome where Beagle kind of looks like Bloodhound, and so it gets confused. And then we have the 7% where we just didn't have enough information to make a call. Um, this is Hubble. Hubble is a golden doodle. And as you can see, if you actually look at just the parts that are golden retriever in red and poodle in, sorry, golden retriever in orange and poodle in red, those two parts are about equal size. That's because there's a golden doodle, half golden retriever, half poodle. There's a few pieces we get confused on, but they tend to be things that are close to one of the breeds. So we see a little bit that comes up as toy poodle and a little bit that comes up as Labrador retriever. And then we have a bigger section of stuff that we're not totally sure about. It's probably, actually, we happen to know Hubble's ancestry. So we know that Hubble is, in fact, 100% golden doodle. She's 50% golden retriever and 50% poodle. So there you're seeing the section where our algorithm isn't quite as good at figuring out what's going on. Um, and then this is Skylar. Skylar was adopted in California from a shelter as a lab pit bull mix. Um, Skylar does, in fact, have a little bit of Labrador in her. Um, but this is actually what most of our mutts look like. And I was kind of amazed by how many different things we were seeing. So I don't know what's in the not match. There could be all sorts of other breeds in the not match. There was just tiny little segments. Um, but the top breeds that came up in Skylar were Dalmatian, Rottweiler, and Golden Retriever. So neither Lab nor Pitbull. Um, you see a little bit of Labrador at 6%, and then um, Staffordshire Bull Terrier. We don't actually have a reference um, data in our, in our reference data set. We don't actually have data for, like, American Pit Bull Terrier. So I, we think that we often match to Staffordshire Bull Terrier when we're kind of looking at a Pit Bull, what people think of as kind of Pit Bull type of ancestry. But it could actually be American Pit Bull Terrier instead of, of Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Um, and then, oh yeah, this is Lucky. Lucky belongs to Jeremy, my group. Another way to show the data is as a little pie chart, as a little bar chart. Um, Jeremy got incredibly upset when we told him his dog was a Shih Tzu. <laughs> Um, he said, my dog is not a shit. We're like, it's genetics. You can't argue with it. It's right there on the, on the screen. Um, so the fun thing that we started to do with Lucky, and we're going to get better at this as, as we kind of go along and we get more data, but not only do we know the overall ancestry, but we can start looking at what's going on with each of his chromosomes. So as I said, each of his chromosomes is made up of all these blocks of ancestry from different breeds. And you can take a closer look, and you can see that on chromosome 10, he actually carries toy poodle ancestry, and he also carries a mutation that... It's a muta mutations aren't necessarily bad, but I shouldn't use the word because people always think they're bad. Um, so he actually carries a variant in a gene called MSRB3, which has been linked to dropped ears in previous research. And it actually is coming in on the toy poodle ancestry. And that is why Lucky does indeed have, have dropped ears is because of that toy poodle ancestry. He also carries um, one copy of the high altitude adaptation that's coming in on the lasso apso ancestry. So if he were living in Tibet, he would be slightly better adapted to it. Um, and he also has the, the, the furnishings kind of mustachey thing that's also apparently got lasso apso ancestry where that mutation is. And then he does carry, he's heterozygous for this, this mutation that's been linked to brachycephaly um, where he's got Boston Terrier ancestry. He's not actually particularly short nosed. And then I looked into it and it turns out that the BMP3 brachycephaly link is, is more, much more complicated than kind of a single gene. Um, oh yeah, put a little pictures of the breeds in there too. Um, and that's lucky. Um, so. Uh, we then set up this project to basically look at um, mutts. And so we said we looked at all of these mutts, and we have figured out 
what breeds are in them using our breed calling algorithm, and we want to know how close people actually can guess this. And we don't have the answers for you yet. We, we know the answers genetically, but we're not telling anybody until the surveys close on our website. Um, so this is our website. It's called muttmix.org. Um, it's open until uh, June 16th, so basically, if we tell people the results right away, they could take a screenshot and put it on Facebook or on Twitter, and then everybody else that took our survey might be influenced by the answers that they already knew about. So we're keeping all the answers for these dogs secret until we actually close the surveys on June 16th, and then we're going to send everybody an email, and they can go check how their results compare to the real results. Um, as I said, I've been kind of overwhelmed by the number of participants. We've got about 31,000 participants as of today. You can still sign up for the next two weeks, and everybody should go do it. You can guess. There's 31 dogs on there. You can guess as many or as few as you want to. We'll still send you your results. You don't have to do all of them. And uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is that right now we have about 13,000 guesses per dog as to what breeds, what the top three breeds are in that dog. And I think that as a, I, I think that'll actually let us start looking not just at which breeds people guess, but possibly why they're guessing them, which traits seem to go along with people guessing particular breeds. Um, the other thing that had really interested me on kind of a social level about this was that we were like, let's ask the top three breeds that are in each dog. It seemed like a reasonable thing to me. They're usually a five, 10, 15% of the dog. It turns out people have a really, really hard time with the third breed. They actually, they look at it, and when you look at a mutt, everybody goes, it's a this and a this, or a this and a this. And so to ask them to guess three things actually turned out to be really hard. And so in the drop-down menu, we actually added the option for the third breed to put in as a, a no choice, just because people were getting really confused and kind of guessing randomly for that one. Um, but it is kind of an interesting insight into how people think about mutts when you think they're only thinking about the top you know, two breeds at a time, but when we look at the genetics of these mutts, they have somewhere between you know, six and 15 or 16 breeds that we can actually even just detect using the methods we're using now, which is pretty cool. Um, so I'm actually finishing up now, and I'm finishing up a little early, which means that everybody online needs to ask lots of questions so we can do the whole question and answer thing and, and, and use some time that way. Um, and uh, I, I sympathize with Claire this morning because it turns out that in, in genetics and genomics, we tend to go to conferences where we're expected to give talks that are 12 minutes long. So when somebody comes up to you and says, you should talk for 45 minutes, it's like, oh my god, how do I talk for 45 minutes? Um, but hopefully this has all gone well for everybody, and they have enjoyed it, and it hasn't been. And I've actually had a chance to actually explain things in a bit more detail. And I just wanted to give a shout out. This is, once again, Nellie the Beagle. But she's now like the beagle that Darwin sailed to the Galapagos on. It was a lot of fun to make that. Um, but a thanks to everybody in my group, um, everybody in the IABC, but especially all of the dog owners and everybody that's given us feedback on this project because it's a really interesting opportunity to, to shape a project um, as we go along. And as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, I'm a geneticist. So when I think about this project, I think about questions we can ask in terms of understanding genetics. But as we talk to more and more people in the behavior world, we start thinking about other more bigger questions that we can ask using this kind of resource. So we're always interested to talk to people about things they'd be interested in in terms of environment and things like that that we could actually start to try and get at with this kind of approach. Um, so thank you very much. And um, please ask all your questions and so I can actually answer them. <laughs>